Love him or love him even more, John Grisham is one of our great American authors. Like his good buddy Stephen King, he made his mark in genre writing and, quite unfairly, was considered lesser by some of the literary crowd. Look, the guy's a writer. It took him three years to write his first novel. He was an attorney and would sneak off during breaks to scribble scenes and legal pads. That book, A Time to Kill, didn't take off immediately. His next, The Firm, was a titanic blockbuster and was the basis for the excellent Sidney Pollack film starring Tom Cruise and one of my many, many teenage crushes, Gene Triplehorn. Grisham didn't look back after that. With a workman's dedication, he turns out a legal thriller each year, a genre he largely invented in its current form, and still finds time to write more literary books. Uh, a great nonfiction book called An Innocent Man, and a series of books for children. The guy built a complex of baseball fields for his local Little League and quietly supports indie bookstores and publications that enrich readers everywhere. So if you're one of the few who haven't picked up one of his books, you're missing out. Writers have so much to learn from John Grisham, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm Kenneth Nichols, the gent who writes the young adult and romantic comedies by Allison Rhodes, and we're going to figure out how Grisham grabs you. But first, a word from our sponsor, Ex Delicto. According to Black's Law Dictionary, that's Latin for a consequence that arises from a crime or violation of the law. When you use Ex Delicto, you unlock the key to all storytelling, consequences. Why did Michael Corleone wipe out the heads of the five families? That was the consequence of their increasing aggression and lack of respect for Michael's territory. One thing happens, then another. Subscribers who use my special promo code Allison, that's A-L-L-I-S-O-N, will receive 20% off their first order. In no time, your characters will keep your plot humming along as they react to what happens to them, which results in yet another action. Ex Delicto. That's why that happened. Ex Delicto is not a lawyer or legal firm and offers no legal advice for entertainment only, not to be confused with Inflagrante Delicto, although there can be Ex Delicto for that too. Okay, we're back. John Grisham is such a great writer in part because he grabs you in so many ways. He doesn't write award-winning 600-page novels in which nothing happens, but the people who read them pretend to enjoy them. He actually cares about telling a story. That requires an idea. Grisham always starts out with a compelling, what if? What was the origin of A Time to Kill? Well, from Grisham's official website, one day at the DeSoto County Courthouse, Grisham overheard the harrowing testimony of a 12-year-old rape victim and was inspired to start a novel exploring what would have happened if the girl's father had murdered her assailants. This is one of the things I love most about storytelling. You start out with a single question, and it blossoms into a great big world of your own design. Not only that, but even the most pacifist parent must admit they don't know what they would do if they were in Carly Haley's shoes. What would you do if your little girl were subject to ridiculously horrifying abuse? See? Grisham grabs you with the what if. Now let's talk about The Firm. I am old, so I remember reading my father's copy of The Firm when I was in my mid-teens. The movie's fantastic. Uh, I still love the movie, but the book, as usual, is better. As a teen, I was captivated by the way Mitch McDeer was fated by Bendini, Lambert, and Locke. He's a poor kid with a jailbird brother and an absentee mother, I could relate, who put his head down and worked his behind off. He and his wife, Abby, are just getting by. But then the representatives of the firm offer him big bucks, a low-interest mortgage, a free lease on a Beamer. The first hundred pages are magical. Until you realize what's going on. I'll let the man himself explain it in his calming baritone. When I was in law school, I had a friend who was a top student. And this guy was uh, heavily recruited. And he would go off to visit law firms. And he came back from a trip and he said, you know, I, I didn't really feel good about that firm. I got the impression that uh, once you join the firm, you never leave. And you're like it's owned by the mafia or something. Well, that was 10 years earlier, but the idea stuck. Boom. And that's all it took. In the hands of a storyteller, that little anecdote is gold. Grisham grabbed you by offering you a glimpse into a world you don't likely inhabit, a world of limitless wealth and power that you experience vicariously through Mitch. Of course, then the what if kicks in, and you realize he's been laying clues the whole time that Bendini, Lambert, and Locke is not what it seems. Okay, so an author grabs us with an idea, but even the best conceit goes to waste if you can't get the reader to pick up the book. Like I said, Grisham got lucky with the firm in a lot of ways. Sure, we're nearly three decades removed, but look at this. That is a great cover. You have the marble background suggesting the dignity and ceremony of the law. You have a young lawyer being pulled by puppet strings. The gold plate looking letters of the title suggests, again, the dignity of the law and the opulence of Mitch's new world. And this isn't a book description breakdown, but to the jacket copy book description breakdown. 
L.A. Law meets The Godfather in the most gripping legal thriller of the year. Okay, so some of you might require a bit of a reminder, but L.A. Law was a big courtroom drama show on NBC at the time. And I really hope that you know what The Godfather is. That's a decent tagline of the X meets X variety. And we know immediately that the book is indeed a legal thriller. Let's look at that first paragraph. Mitchell Y. McDear has worked hard to get where he is, third in his class at Harvard Law. Aggressively recruited by all the top firms and initially headed for Wall Street, Mitch surprises everyone by joining Bendini, Lambert, and Locke, a very private, very rich tax firm in Memphis. Mitch and his wife Abby move to Tennessee and quickly settle into their new life. They're young, happy, and on the fast track. Or so they think. Again, the book description hammers hard on the part that engaged me so much as a kid. Grisham appeals to the fantasy aspect of Mitch McDear's situation. What would it be like to be young and smart and attractive with the spouse you love and both of you are finally achieving the wealth and comfort you've always dreamed about? The or so they think represents a turn. The next paragraph. Soon, though, Mitch senses trouble. Two of the partners die in a suspicious diving accident off Grand Cayman. The firm's management is overly proud of the fact that no one has ever resigned, and security measures of the firm are, even for a company with billionaire clients, more than a little stringent. Then, suddenly, Mitch's vague suspicions come to life. While eating alone at a nearby diner, he is approached by a man named Terrence, who claims to be with the FBI. Terrence tells Mitch that the firm's security people have bugged his phone, his office, and probably his car, that he is in great danger and should be extremely careful, that he cannot tell his soul of their meeting, and that the FBI will contact him again soon. Then he is gone. The paragraph mentions what may be the inciting incident of the novel. What's the inciting incident? It's the moment in the story after which everything is changed. The status quo has been disrupted forever. Harry Potter lives under the stairs and has to deal with the Dursleys. The same thing every day. Then, Hagrid shows up and says... You're a wizard, Harry. The world is different forever. The inciting incident for the firm is the moment that the FBI's agent Terrence talks to Mitch at the diner, telling him that the firm is corrupt and that the only way to leave Bandini, Lambert, and Locke is in a coffin. Before that, Mitch was recruited and hired and taking his bar exam and making money and working 19 hours a day and neglecting Abby. Everything was wonderful. The status quo was normal. Then Terrence comes along. Come to think of it, I see a lot of book descriptions that don't include the inciting incident. Maybe some writers think that the inciting incident is a spoiler? I don't know. But the another way that Grisham gets you is by being upfront with the grand conceit of the novel. Why hide it, particularly when you're reading the book to sail along with the mystery? I do have to wonder if the jacket copy slash book description would be a tad shorter if Grisham had been Grisham at that point. Looking at the rest of the description, I do think that the folks at Doubleday were a tad verbose because of the era. Oh my god, the book was first published so long ago, I know. But also because Grisham was not then a known quantity. Alright, check it out. Here's the last part. In subsequent meetings with Terrence, Mitch is told that the FBI has been studying Bandini, Lambert, and Locke for years, and that while they have a few legitimate clients, they are most assuredly not a law firm. When Mitch learns what they really are, he is at first shocked, then frightened. When he learns what they really do and how they do it, he is terrified. And when Terrence tells him the FBI needs an informant inside the firm, he realizes he's trapped. The FBI will bust him if he doesn't cooperate, and the firm will kill him if he does. There's no way out. Or is there? Blending the suspense of Ken Follett with the legal intrigue of Scott Turo, this is one of those rare novels that grab you on page one and simply cannot be put down. The Double A people finish with two tried and true conventions of book description. There's the name checking, followed in Turo, and the explanation of how the reader will feel upon finishing the novel. Does it make you feel better knowing that John Grisham puts on his book description pants one leg at a time just like you? So, how does Grisham grab you? Big concepts with big heart. The mob takes out a U.S. attorney. The hit is witnessed by a young boy. Boom! Big concept. Big heart. We care for the child's welfare. Grisham doesn't waste your time by telling you he's going to interbulate your knowingness against a panoramic vista of questioning and recontextual. <laughs> huh. Huh. Oh. Okay, see, that's the kind of stuff that you see in book descriptions for literary books that are only good for curing insomnia or making people think you're smart. Boundless creative curiosity. Like Stephen King, Grisham keeps you on your toes. Yes, he pumps out a legal thriller each year, come hell or high water. That's not a bad thing. That's not to say that he's just doing what people want. He's working in the genre that he sort of created, and that is perfectly suited to his interests and education. 
Did you know he was a member of the Mississippi House of Representatives for years? He cares about the government and wants laws to protect the people who need protection. But he also writes those kids' books, the excellent Camino Island series or mysteries. He writes about Christmas. He writes about baseball. Great characters. Grisham doesn't get enough credit for his characters. I've been fond of old Mitchell Y. McDeer and Abby for longer than I'd like to admit because it makes me feel old. Grisham understands that drama comes from characters. His world is populated with interesting people who get a moment in the sun, even if it's just a paragraph of interesting background. You know, wouldn't it be nice to have John Grisham, THE John Grisham, look over your shoulder as you conceive, outline, and write your thriller? Wouldn't that be an amazing experience? But that's never going to happen. I mean, you'd have to be a close personal friend of John Gr Guess what? Grisham actually did mentor a friend in the art of writing a novel, providing extensive notes. And Grisham is such a mensch that he allowed the friend to include his letters in a book about their journey. But that's a story for another video. If you want me to make that video and tell that story, let me know. Leave a comment. Which Grisham is your favorite? Subscribe to the channel. I'm here because I like helping other writers almost as much as I like writing my own stuff. Speaking of which, the links to my books are down below. I write young adult, and I write uh, contemporary romance, and my books are kind of fun, and they're very cheap. Uh, and if you could help me out, Jay Sherman. Buy my book! Buy my book! Buy my book! Buy my book! All right, thank you. And that's all for now. I'm Kenneth Nichols, doing business as Allison Rhodes, here to remind you, books are good.